We are ready for the next speaker, Professor Vitor Vasconcelos, full, process, full professor of the Faculty of Sciences of Porto University and director of the, the Interdisciplinary Center of Marine and Environmental Research. Main research uh, focus on, on cyanobacteria secondary metabolites and their uses, toxins and molecules with biotechnological applications. So please, Professor Vasconcelos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Veronica, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to be in this Parma Summer School. So um, I will be talking uh, about cyanobacteria and microalgae, which are some of the issues that uh, have been taking care of my research for the past uh, years. And I will give you some hints on the positive way, taking into account what are the main advantages of using cyanobacteria and microalgae as food, but also on the disadvantages, taking into account that cyanobacteria especially, but also some microalgae can produce toxins, which are secondary metabolites that can pose uh, risks uh, to the consumers, but also to the environment where these uh, organisms live. So cyanobacteria are very old organisms. In fact, they are um, some of the oldest organisms we know uh, in, in our planet. And this is very interesting because it gives us also the opportunity to work with organisms that have in their DNA uh, information regarding the passing of these different environments in our planet and that gives them the advantage of producing uh, very interesting secondary metabolites that can for one side protect them against all these changes but on the other side we can use them in terms of biotechnological applications. Uh, in fact, cyanobacteria are uh, one of the oldest organisms and in fact they were the first producers of oxygen uh, in, in our planet and the fact that we live in a planet as we do now, we do that uh, to cyanobacteria. Uh, they still are very important in terms of these ecosystem services because they produce about half of the earth oxygen, especially uh, micro cyanobacteria like Procolococcus and Synecococcus in the ocean. Um, usually when we speak about oxygen, we talk about forests, but in fact is in the ocean where most of the oxygen is, is produced. But uh, whenever there is a high eutrophication of the, of the ecosystems, and these are some examples of cyanobacteria blooms in Portugal, they can occur in high densities and this may cause problems in terms of the uses of the water for different purposes for instance to produce water for drinking but also uh, for the use of water in terms of aquaculture in terms of recreation uh, and even in terms of uh, their uses in uh, agriculture uh, in fact, cyanobacteria live in a very wide uh, array of uh, environments, not just in the water, but also in soils, in um, hot uh, springs, in caves, uh, and inclusive also in um, organisms uh, where they can live in symbiosis. So they are quite widespread in our, in our planet. But of course, uh, and this was the main reason I started to study cyanobacteria, is because they can produce toxins, and these toxins can cause damage to the environment, they can cause fish kills, but they can also cause uh, human uh, disorders and human diseases. This is due to a different variety of, of toxins. Uh, um, most of them can have like uh, hepatotoxic uh, activity. They can cause liver damages, very similar to what we have with hepatitis or uh, alcoholism. They can cause also um, cytotoxicity, so like cylinder spermopsis, which is a toxin that can cause uh, severe uh, damage to different types of cells in our human body, or they can cause neurotoxicity, like is the case of saxitoxins, which are toxins that are also presented in uh, red tides, and so they can also contaminate food items like mussels, shrimps, or fish, especially in the marine environment. So there is a huge variety of 
toxins. Now we know hundreds of, of toxins that can be produced by cyanobacteria that can go from this very large molecule, which is polytoxin, which is produced also by some dinoflagellates and can come in contaminate also water, especially in uh, uh, recreational areas, in the Mediterranean, for instance, is very, is very common, to a very small molecule like anatoxin A, which is an alkaloid, but has a strong neurotoxicity. It can kill a mouse in more or less than two minutes, and so whenever uh, we have food items contaminated with these toxins, they can cause also severe risks for uh, our use. Uh, so, in terms of human health, how can we be exposed to these toxins? Uh, we can be exposed via inhalation if we are using, for instance, water contaminated with toxins in our daily activities, like uh, having a shower at home or using the water contaminated in uh, recreational areas. Uh, we can, of course, be contaminated by ingestion, not just in terms of contaminated water, but also in food items, and I will come back later to this. And the most severe case is when these toxins are present in water that is used for dialysis. And in this case, uh, we have reports uh, in the last uh, decade of last century where more than 60 people were killed by uh, being exposed to water with these toxins. So, so they, they are really dangerous and they are, can they cause severe damage to uh, our bodies. As well, they can cause damages to the environment. We did a lot of work in terms of ecotoxicological effects, showing, for instance, in this case, that these toxins can cause uh, damage to uh, aquatic plants like lemna, and so acting as, as a, a, a biological weapon in terms of allelopathy. They can also cause damage to fish that live in these waters, either fish that we use as food uh, or uh, ordinary fish that are not uh, in our food chain. Uh, but they can also be affecting uh, crops like agricultural crops. Here we did some work with tomatoes that were um, uh, watered with water containing toxins of cyanobacteria and uh, there was a severe accumulation of these toxins in these uh, plants. So plants especially used for agriculture if they are water with uh, water containing the toxins can be vectors and so they can accumulate the toxins and can be vectors of these toxins and uh, introduce the toxins in our in our food chain so taking into account all these risks uh, we should say that the organisms that can mostly accumulate toxins are mollusks, especially bivalves and gastropods that can accumulate more than 100 micrograms per gram. Um, and uh, I, I can just put this into uh, perspective and uh, one uh, microgram per liter is the maximum allowed level of these toxins in drinking water. So mollusks, if they are contaminated with these toxins in a single gram, they can more or less reach the maximum dose that is allowed for uh, drinking water. So this is, uh, of course, uh, a risk. But of course, cyanobacteria do not produce only toxins. They can produce other secondary metabolites, and we, are being, we have been working a lot in these aspects. Uh, in this case, for instance, we uh, analyzed uh, mo molecules that we call portoamides that are or these ring molecules that have a very interesting uh, allelopathic uh, activity against other microalgae, so they can be used also to control blooms of other microalgae. But these molecules that we unravel in uh, 2010 and published in 2010 can also be used for other positive uh, applications in terms of human health, as you, you will see uh, very shortly. Uh, we are working also in, in this application of these molecules as anti-fouling. Uh, as you may know, uh, biofouling is a very problematic process, not just in terms of the maritime industry, because it can cause problems in ships and uh, nets and other types of uh, structures, but they can also cause problems in uh, other industries, like food industry, for instance, if uh, uh, the biofouling is formed in pipes that are used to uh, carry water, for instance, for this type of industry. So it's very important to find solutions, especially uh, non um, 
damage causes solutions uh, with uh, molecules that can be uh, biodegradable like this cyanobacteria. And, and we proved that portoamides, the same that I showed you before, can also be used as antifouling molecules. Uh, but we are also concerned about the potential use and the positive use of these secondary metabolites of cyanobacteria and microalgae as uh, antimicrobial. Uh, uh, as you know, there are um, not many um, uh, anti, anti, antibiotics uh, being discovered recently. We have severe problems, especially at uh, hospitality environment, where um, bacteria that are multi-drug resistant are increasing. Uh, and then so there is a, an issue, there is a problem that we need to solve, which is to find new antibiotics. And uh, we saw that some cyanobacteria extracts could in fact inhibit some of these bacteria. And in the framework, of an European project that uh, was called No More Film, we were looking for uh, microalgae and cyanobacteria secondary metabolites that could be used exactly to prevent biofilms in hospital environments, especially against infections caused by uh, the use of catheters or the use of prothesis whenever we have to substitute a bone uh, if that is needed. And uh, we tested hundreds of microalgae and cyanobacteria strains from three different culture collections, our own a culture collection in Coimbra University and a culture collection in France. And in fact, we, we saw that uh, one of our strains uh, was... Uh, producing a molecule that uh, is a chlorosferolactylate that uh, is a, a allogenated uh, lactylate um, that was really effective against the biofilm formation, especially um, of Staphylococcus aureus, which is one of the main uh, bacteria that cause infections in hospitals. And so what we did, we patented this knowledge and we are now in the process of uh, using this molecule in catheters and prothesis, uh, using animal models, and hopefully in not many years, we will have a novel antibiotic that can be used for this. So, Cyanobacteria microalgae can also be very beneficial in terms of the production of these novel molecules. We are also doing that and showing that uh, these organisms can also be used to prevent uh, cancer. And this is one of the works that we did with some of our strains, where we also isolated a novel compound called Yeridin B that we tested against different cell lines of human cancer. And uh, uh, only the colon adenocarcinoma responded uh, positively to this molecule, which means that this is not a very toxic molecule against all types of cells. And in fact, we tested this molecule against normal uh, human um, uh, colon cells and they were not affected by the molecule. So this shows that this could be clearly a novel uh, a molecule that could be used to treat uh, colon cancer. And now we are in the process of understanding the mechanism of action of these molecules, uh, take into account that they seem to affect especially the energy uh, balance of the cells. In, in the left uh, slide, you can see a control um, a control cell, so in the red spots, which are mitochondria. And when we treat the colon adenocarcinoma cells with our molecule, most of these red dots, which are the mitochondria, disappear. So this molecule seems to affect specifically the, um, um, uh, the mitochondria in this, in this cell, I by that affecting the energy balance of, of, of the cell. We are doing that with other molecules. In the case, we are working with portoamides. So this is just to show you that, in fact, this um, the use of cyanobacteria and, and the microalgae can have these beneficial effects. And this is some, are some of the claims that we can use whenever we are trying to uh, establish a novel food regarding uh, cyanobacteria or, or microalgae. And in fact, they are nowadays uh, used. Uh, there are at least uh, five species of cyanobacteria that uh, were proved to be used before 1997. And so one of them or two of them are chlorella and spirulina. Um, in fact, spirulina 
spirulina nowadays is is called uh, arthrospira. Uh, but uh, some of these cyanobacteria and microalgae are widely used, uh, not just as food supplements, as I'm showing here, but also as uh, food ingredients and uh, um, ingredients in other sources. Uh, and namely used also as, as feed for, for, uh, for animals, for the animal industry. And this is the uh, low processing way of using cyanobacteria and microalgae, and that is why also there are uh, low prices regarding this, this, uh, these organisms. So what, what are we uh, talking about when we talk about food supplements based on microalgae? They can be produced in very different ways, in different parts of the world. And nowadays, there is not, uh, I would say, a, a very strict control in terms of the quality and in terms of the risks. And in fact, some years ago, we did buy some of these food supplements with one of the cyanobacteria that is uh, authorized, which is a phenizomenon flozaque, from Klamath Lake, which is a, a, a lake in the U.S. that commercialized cyanobacteria that are uh, naturally grown in, in, a, in, a, in a lake. And what we did was using multiplex PCR, uh, we analyzed these 12 food supplements that we bought uh, and tried to investigate if these food supplements were in fact cyanobacteria, and this can be showed by the first line. But then we test them against uh, uh, other primers that were uh, assigned to understand if these supplements could be contaminated, namely with microcystis, which is one of the cyanobacteria that produce toxins, and also with microcystin, which is the toxin that is produced by this, uh, this cyanobacteria. And we used specific primers to do that. And as you can see here, the, the 12 food, su food supplements based on aphanizomenon were all contaminated with microcystis, and they all had the microcystin gene cluster that is responsible for the production of toxins. And this did not happen with other food supplements that we analyzed based on Nostoc and spirulina. So this was really uh, only uh, affecting these uh, phanizomenon flozaque supplements uh, and in fact using uh, immunological uh, methods but also uh, chemical methods like LCMS we proved that all these food supplements were contaminated with the, with the toxin. So this means that there is a, a, a very important need uh, for risk assessment to understand in all these food supplements, but especially in those that are produced uh, at open air, not just uh, naturally produced like this aphanizomenon flozaque, but also in open air ponds, because they can easily be contaminated with the toxins. And we did that uh, also uh, with another food supplement. In this case, it was a food supplement based with in chlorella, which is the green algae, that produced a reaction in a cancer patient that was being treated for cancer and was taking also these food supplements, developed the severe uh, hepatotoxicosis, and we analyzed the food supplements the person was taking, and in fact, we also proved that it was contaminated with its cyanobacteria, so not just the chlorella that was in the label, and in fact, there were high levels of the toxins. So this is just to show you that the Risks exist and we need, and now we have the tools, either at molecular level, but also at chemical level. So, uh, this cyanobacteria and microalgae can also be uh, positively used, and in this case, we are using uh, some uh, obesity, anti-obesity tests uh, with uh, fish, uh, in this case, zebrafish model, and we can prove that cyanobacteria that have no toxins can also be used as an anti-obesity uh, uh, drug. In this case, as a nutraceutical, take into account the results that we have been obtaining. This is also a patent knowledge, and this is just to end this part of the presentation with a positive uh, message. So, finally, I would like to tell you that taking into account that novel um, cyanobacteria and novel microalgae are being uh, uh, assayed for uh, novel foods or as novel foods, uh, taking into account not just the use in different countries of the world, but also in Europe. Uh, we just would like to state that the uh, culture collections of these organisms are very important tools. 
especially for this exploitation uh, of uh, uh, organisms and to be used as a source of these organisms for the uh, production of, of, uh, of novel foods. Uh, we have a, a culture collection that uh, is called Lesh CC. It's a very, um, I would say, established well, culture collection. We started this culture collection more than 32 years ago, composed of more than 2,000 strains of cyanobacteria and microalgae. It's available to the public. It's registered in World Federation of Culture Collections, but also in the European Culture Collection Organization. It's mostly based in Portugal, so more than 90 strains are isolated from Portugal, but we have also collaborations from all over the world. It's quite well known and characterized from a molecular point of view, not just in terms of taxonomy, but also in terms of the risks related to the toxin production. And so we can assure that the strains that we could provide are uh, not are free of toxins, uh, taking into account all these, all these studies. Uh, we have uh, good facilities for the cultivation of these organisms, for the optimization of the culture using uh, namely some of these uh, um, uh, photobioreactors. And we have also a collaboration with companies in Portugal that can produce this uh, microalgae and cyanobacteria in large uh, amounts. So uh, there is uh, an assurance that the production in this case can be controlled because this is a closed uh, uh, cultivation. So as take home messages, I just want to stress out that cyanobacteria blooms are still here and the impact has to be assured, but we have to use especially culture collections as good resources for the production of uh, especially novel foods based on cyanobacteria and microalgae. And nowadays we have the tools, especially at molecular level, but also at the chemical level, to understand what are the risks related to the production of the toxins, but also what are the opportunities, taking into account that many of these organisms can have molecules that in fact can enhance uh, the use of uh, the, these organisms as food, not just based on the nutritional value, but especially on this added value, taking into account the positive uh, reactions that they can produce in, in, in the human body. So I want to thank all my team, I want to thank uh, Parma Summer School, and I want to thank all of you for listening.